Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And as we've said before, this transformation is happening all over the place. It's not just the technology providers, the technology users, and its implications on society are huge. So here with us today is Sudha Mahajan. Sudha, tell us about you. And how did you become the Sudha we all know today? Thank you, Shankar. It has been a journey. I'm Sudha Mahajan. I work as a product partner and general manager in Azure Core. Core is the fundamental division of what empowers the cloud. It consists of networking, storage, and compute organizations. I lead a product division, which is focused on network connectivity. It also focuses on secure app delivery and domains as the three major pillars. Which means if you are sitting somewhere, you're an enterprise who is trying to connect to cloud, you need some kind of connectivity. You have on-prem devices and you want to get to the cloud, the connectivity options that are available to you privately, those are the services that I manage. Then we have a huge domains business and the applications that your people build, how to deliver them securely without losing anything in the cloud, the services that are required are also managed under me in Azure Networking. I have been at Microsoft for about five years and I also had the privilege of working in various different companies. Prior to this, I was at eBay leading their first party advertising business and developer ecosystem. And before that, I was the head of product past for experiences for Flipkart. It's Intel's largest e-commerce company. And I was the first woman expat to be hired from Silicon Valley and we relocated to India to join them. Before Flipkart, I was at Yahoo, the director leading their advertising business, which is the premium business for Yahoo, along with the data platforms. And before Yahoo, I've worked in two enterprise companies. Today, one of them is called TiVo, and then one was a startup called Model N. And before that, I came to the United States to do my master's in computer science. This is what has made me the person that you're talking to today over the years, working in various different companies, acquiring the domain expertise, working with amazing talent, and then building new products, which are really meaningful to the customers and matters a lot to the industry. That's an exciting journey, Sudha. A lot of the companies you've worked with are actually providing services like cloud services and other SaaS-based services to large companies. You also worked on consumer products. How did you make that switch back and forth between what's important for individual customers versus large corporations? That switch is fairly easy, only if you can understand one connection. At the end of the day, the products that you're selling to the enterprises, those enterprises may use your services, but the end, the end of the day, their end customers matter. And majority of their time, the end customers is the consumer. When I stepped into the enterprise world, this was intriguing to me exactly these corporations who are using my products what are they doing with it so i made a switch to yahoo yahoo is a consumer oriented company now here is the catch every person that knows yahoo today knows through the content that they are consuming whether you're using yahoo mail you're using yahoo finance or homepage those are the consumers but the products that i led were actually advertising products and data products Advertising products are leveraged by the advertisers and those advertisers are companies like Netflix, AT&T, Volkswagen. These are again the enterprises. So as I said, the switch between these two is fairly simple. If you can make that connection, who is the actual user of your product and who is giving you the feedback? Whose feedback matters that you can incorporate into your products and build the awesome products? So coming back after that, you know, when I came, eBay was, again, if you think about it, eBay by itself is a consumer company because people like you and me, we go there and buy the products. But then who are the sellers? Sellers are, again, small brands and enterprises, right? So there has always been that connection between enterprises and consumers. So when I came to Microsoft, it was fairly that easy connection that made me establish that, okay, cloud consumers might be enterprises, but what matters to us is their end customers because that business cannot be impacted. So I never thought it was like a major switch between these two companies or these two segment of customers. It just felt very natural. I remember the early days of Microsoft when individuals bought the tools for their PCs, whether it's PowerPoint, Excel, it's become more of a corporate business. Has the company and has the approach shifted over time? If at all it has shifted, I'll only say it has become more and more evident. Security is the P0 and the most important thing. Any customer who is coming to Microsoft, it's our responsibility to make sure that 
every data or everything about the customer is 100% secure from the information that they provide, the secrets. So Microsoft takes it really seriously. We do everything in our power to make sure we are 100% secure from every layer of networking, from physical devices to all the way to the SaaS applications which are coming to Microsoft. So if you ask me, has things have changed? Things have changed for better and for good. I feel far more confident today putting my workloads in cloud because I know it's the hands of a great company who cannot sleep till every workload is secure. So that's a shift that I've seen and that fundamental shift is the customers come first and that obsession is what drives the technology. That's wonderful. On one hand, you've got the networking piece, you've got the storage piece, the security. Many of the people who work with you probably think in silos, right? It's very natural. My focus is networking. My focus is security. How do you bridge the gap? How do you make sure that things don't fall to the crack? So there are two things which are very, very critical to us. One is end-to-end -end user experience. And in this case, when we say user experience, customer comes first. When customers comes to cloud or to Microsoft, to them, the only one thing that matters is that the, the fundamental technology that they're using from us to them networking, storage, compute, or any of the pillar which is behind the cloud does not matter. Only thing that matters is once they bring their workloads to Azure, it should be fundamentally functioning. We should be able to provide them with a reliable service. We should be able to provide them with an accurate service, low latency. All those needs, when we think about it to the customers, these silos do not matter. So you're right, at the end of the day, when we are working with our, with our peers, these Equations comes in, hey, my area is this, so I have built an expertise around it, but collaboration is the fundamental pillar. And I think this is where Microsoft culture comes into being. This is so interesting that more than technology, I'm talking to you about the culture, but the culture of Microsoft is collaboration. We are not know-it-all people, we are learn-it-all people. And that drives who we are. As a result of it, when a customer comes, you will see that obsession coming out in every person to solve that fundamental problem for the customer. Any person who picks up the problem, they try to solve it end-to-end, -end, jointly working with other teams collaboratively because cloud is huge and not every person, not a single person will know everything. So when we work together for a customer seamlessly, there is usually one GC that they're working with so that it does not come across silos. But behind the scenes, we are collaborating with many other teams to make sure that the customer issues result in the finest and the fastest and the most accurate way. So this is how we work. Shankar, as you said, technology layer is vast, but on the other side, culture is the same that fuels the technology. So Sudha, when you joined these companies, were they already the big brands that they are? I mean, each one of them, eBay, Flipkart, Yahoo. Shankar, it's a very interesting question, but I'll tell you one thing. Speaking from the heart, many times we don't plan our journeys. And even if we do, not necessarily everything happens as per plan. I remember first time when I applied at Yahoo, and that's when the interview happened. And when they made me an offer, I was super excited. I worked there for seven and a half years. I was not looking to change, though Yahoo had gone through multiple churns and ups and downs. Everybody knows that Yahoo has gone through multiple changes to evolve into a different company altogether from content to technology. And there were so many questions that were being asked. While I was working there, Flipkart happened. It happened naturally. I was not looking, I was not applying. And suddenly, like someone just found me on LinkedIn and just decided to have me come over and speak to the management. And when that happened, the rest is history. I came back from India after the interview. I was super impressed with the technology that they have built, the kind of people that they have hired. For the first time, I felt it doesn't matter whether you're in Silicon Valley or you're in India. This is the kind of talent that you want to work with. This is a change that you actually want to drive in society. So Flipkart really came from the heart. And the whole change happened after the interview. Now, while we were in India, my husband decided to come back to the United States for his job. And during that time, I interviewed with eBay. There were other companies too, but I ended up selecting eBay, particularly for one reason, because my background gelled very well. It was a combination of advertising and e-commerce. While working in, in Flipkart, I will build the domain expertise in e-commerce. And prior to that, my background was advertising. So this company brought that unique perspective that I was looking for, where I can thrive. And while I was working for eBay, out of nowhere, Microsoft reached out and there was an excitement built in me that 
cloud technology is the most happening technology. This is a company which is giving me a chance to learn something new. And if I get into it now, this will pave the way for a much bigger learning that I'll cherish for the lifetime. And that's how Microsoft happened. Now to your question, Shankar, did I choose it this way? I would say to a large extent, destiny chose it this way for me and I have always appreciated it. I'm not the kind of person who believe that, okay, let's choose the best and go after it. I'm the kind of person who believes whatever is in front of you, make the best out of it. That philosophy in life has helped to some degree. That's amazing, Sada. In the middle of a really good career, you decided to go take an expat position at Flipkart. Cultures matter, as you said. Your work culture must have been quite different. What was it like working as an expat and then coming back to the U.S. again in a different environment? This is something very interesting. When I left India, I had not worked in India much, so I had no experience what to expect. So when I was going to India, I knew that there are certain things which are paradigm shift, while certain I have no idea what I was signing up for. The good thing is, while we say the cultures are different, yes, they are indeed very different, but there are some similarities. The whole cross-pollination that has happened, like the management team and some key hires that they made during the time who have moved from US to India brought that culture. So there was that intentional shift where the cultures were blending. But then there are certain things which are very, very unique to India. I'll give you a couple of interesting anecdotes. Here, when we have to make a decision, we come to the room, we have a very open dialogue about it, and then we finally make a decision. India that way is still a very nascent market when it comes to decision making. Let's say two people went downstairs over lunch or over smoke. They just talked about an issue and then they just decided to move forward with it. While the rest of the stakeholders are like, okay, it is like as per need basis, not as well, let's just come and collaborate and just make a decision. But then things move fast and this is expected. It is not considered to be a unique way. That's culturally very different. Once you get used to, then some of these things don't matter. Another thing which is very different because Flipkart is based in Bangalore and there's a huge traffic problem. People will come to work usually late after the normal working hours. Most of the time around eight, I was a person who is very used to that Silicon Valley culture. When I went to work eight, eight thirty, the elevators will be empty many times on my floor. I'll just come and open the lights. There was nobody else on that floor at that point of time. People will come around lunchtime, which we call it lunchtime, like 12 noon or so or 11.30. And then people will stay much longer, like 8 o'clock was a normal time till people are in the office. And you'll see the energy is coming back to office around like 5.30, 6 o'clock. Seems like the office is full. So that part is very different where in the US, we look forward to the day getting over around 6, 6.30 so that we can go back to your families and spend time while in India, at least. And I can't speak for the whole of India, particularly in Bangalore, and this could be because of traffic problem, people were mostly in the office till 8, 8.30. It's not considered to be late. Using that term late was just unusual. So yes, those cultures, I would say, was different. Since I didn't know what I was signing up for, adjusting was easy because I just went with a very open mind and then that became a part of my life. Very interesting. Now, you worked in multiple sectors. You worked in advertising, now cloud and enterprise. Of which one did you find the most interesting and why? It's a very hard question to answer, Shankar. I would say everything that I worked on, I just worked on with one mindset, which is like, am I learning? And will this learning help to contribute back to the society in some way or the other? And with that mindset, I would say I totally enjoyed learning about advertising technology. You'll be surprised that advertising technology was the first time when I learned about AI. Today, generative AI is such a big thing that everybody is talking about. At that point of time, maybe cognitive was much more prevalent, machine learning, learning language models, which are not large language models, not LLMs the way we use today with billions combination. Then it was much smaller, but then the targeting was getting more and more accurate. So AI was the technology that was used everywhere. I am so proud to say that I learned the technology during my Yahoo days. Then you think about e-commerce. It itself is a very big area because everybody is transacting something. 
even if it's not transacting with your company or on your platform, but everybody purchases something or the other. So if you think about it, the TAM is just huge. And cloud, which is like my next favorite, I would say, my God, this is a technology where a life and safety customer, a mission critical customer brings their workload, trusting another company, a platform, assuming that that will never go down and their business will never be impacted. You actually have your trust and that trust matters. Working on a technology like that, I would say, is one among my most favorite ones. Though I would say that everything that I've worked on, there is something or the other that I'm extremely proud of and the learning. The philosophy and the principle still remains the same. Am I learning and will this learning be used at some point of time to contribute back to the society? So that's the most exciting part of my journey. Speaking of the cloud, it's been changing a lot. I remember even Larry Ellison saying it's never going to be real. But today, practically everything that we do as some elements in the cloud. Where do you see the future of the cloud? Truly, I would expect that every enterprise will be moving to cloud. Today, we are already seeing that shift happening. There are companies which are born in cloud. If a person is opening up a new company, whether it's in the business of commerce or it's in consumer or anything, their core business they do not want to start by having on-prem branch. They directly want to put their workloads in cloud. We are seeing that in cloud native most of the time. But let's talk about the enterprise that has been existing, the large companies that have set up huge data centers. They are also moving to the cloud because managing all of that business, which is not the core to their heart, is very difficult and it's time consuming. It's cost intensive. So naturally that shift is happening. To me, I would say in another decade or two decades, we'll, we'll have a word where majority of the workloads will be running in cloud. There is no U-turn from here. The technology that stays on-prem likely will be due to the reasons because of government reasons, because the data cannot leave your on-prem because of some specific reasons which are very, very core to your company or to the government rules or they're subjected to like regions uh, or those parameters. But besides that, I believe in it's just a matter of decade or two decades when every company that we know as of today will have something or the other running in cloud. And the only thing that I expect, it will continue to have more and more traffic to the cloud and not going back. As the cloud gets bigger and we have hybrids and all kinds of things, the edges are also getting sharper. What's the future of edge computing and how will this marriage of the cloud and all these heterogeneous edges, how will they play together in symphony? Edges are being used. Everybody wants the computer to be closer to the customer because latency is a big deal, right? And it's the kind of customer that is dictating some of these needs. If you're a gaming customer, staying close to the edge makes far more sense and your workloads should be running from the edge. So staying true to the technology, the word will be DCs and edges. And we will have to continue to invest in both these technologies to make sure that every kind of customers, the customers which are very sensitive to latency are running onto the edges. And the customers were completely okay with a little bit of acceptable latency, their workloads are running on DCs. It depends on what your use case is, what your needs are. And based on that, you can run your business from edges or you can run your business from DC. The real word or the cloud word will consist of both of these. You will not see one over another. The edges will continue to grow and so will the DCs. It's like a forest, not just a tree anymore. Absolutely. So you have worked in many roles, engineering and technology, marketing, large enterprise roles, as well as people-oriented roles. Which one did you find the most challenging? I would rather put it, what is the most exciting one for me? Because the exciting one is always very challenging as well. So it's a product management role. As I've grown in the career, I became people manager about 16 years ago, M1, then M2. And then as a GM, there are people who are reporting in the deeper layers as well. When you say the you know, most challenging, as I said, the, this is the most exciting part of me, learning from the customers, what really matters to them, building the products, which brings the value and the impact to the society. Likewise, because this journey cannot be done alone, the scope and the platform is just huge. You need to bring people along, bring the teams together, having that shared vision that you can sell to the team, making sure that they are bought into the right vision and they are working towards the same mission and goal that you have set forth. That itself is a very amazing area, super exciting, uh, where I feel that the people who are coming fresh from the college, they have so much of energy. If we can channel it in the right way, we are building the future not just the future of the technology, not just the future of the products, but also the future of the companies where 
in few decades from now, people who are young will be taking over all the leadership positions. Do we have the right talent in place to make that happen? That's another exciting area I get very passionate about. Speaking of young people and people joining the workforce, the world is changing really rapidly. I'm talking about every month. It's a different world now. It causes a lot of anxiety. What advice do you have for people joining the workforce or are in mid-career and are looking at what else to do? So my advice will be only one thing, be agile. It's a term that we use very often from ensuring perspective, but even from people perspective, I'll say be agile. The technology is going to change. Last year, no one was talking about AI. And in one year, the whole world changed. So be ready to pivot and don't be afraid of change because the world around you is always going to change. I have seen changes. Yahoo was changing every day. My own domains have changed. The way the product management is done has changed from coming up with like large releases to HR releases. So be ready to accept the change, embrace it and run with it. The moment you start resisting it, just take a pause, rethink. And once you rethink, the clarity will naturally come to you. There are times where I, I will say, okay, fine, be agile and consider innovation and agility as a part of the rhythm of the business. There are certain times I will say people who are in mid-career, my one suggestion would be there are times when you have to slow down in order to move fast. Take that as a mantra. Use your own intelligence to know when to move fast and run with it because you have to be the number one company, number one product and be the first in the market. But there are times when you are making mistakes at that point of time, take a pause, just rethink and then re-collaborate and then move forward because that slowness will bring the fastness that you're looking for. We all need those passes. We live in a 24 by 7 by 365 world where there's ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous reach, everybody's connected. You can't give the excuse, sorry, I'm on vacation, I'm not connected anymore. How do you find that work-life balance? Shankar, there's a very interesting term which has been coined and that is called, many people say work-life balance, but most people say work-life harmony, which means that there are times when either of them will not be perfect. And you just need to be cautious at what point of time, what is needed the most. An important day for your kids, you may be able to manage your meetings, but if it's a very crucial customer meeting and you can put your personal life a little bit at, at a different front, then make that adjustment because at the end of the day, work is a very important part of your life and your life and your kids and family is also the most important part. That harmony needs to come from within and there has to be cautious effort. And I would say 100% of the time, you will not get it right. So be okay with that. There are days in my life, Shankar, when I have sat and cried over missing an important event in my kid's school because there was just no way out. I was traveling for customer visits and my son had a different expectation and my husband stepped in. And this is where family comes in too. Your spouses are able to support you or your partners are able to support you. Maintain that harmony because that's very important for you to manage or maintain that balance that you're talking about. The way technology is progressing the speed at which it's progressing, technology can also go in different directions. It could lead to chaos, as some people worry, or it could lead to this utopian sense where everybody is connected and all that needs are met. Where do you see all this technology going at this time? I look at technology in the front and center of bringing the right change to the world. There are always two sides of the coin. You look at AI, people are very threatened by AI, and there are people who are considering it as one of the best inventions of the era. I would look at it at the most positive side. Yes, this is there to make us more productive. It is going to change the world that we have never imagined, but these are also the tools. If you use it in your favor, they are going to really help you to make a difference to be productive, to make that difference that will set you apart and will bring out your differentiation. There can be, yes, the negatives of this, and this is where the cautiousness comes in. But I'm not worried about it because we are working towards making sure that there's responsible AI and every technology has to be held by the people who can responsibly put it in the right hands. And that's when we really make a difference in the right way. So I'm very bullish on it. I'm very positive on it, Shankar. This is my way of looking. Me too. That's why I have this whole series. And speaking of which, it is a very, very complex world. Uh, that's why I talk to a lot of people. Thank you, Sudha, for your time. And to everybody out there, 
we need to know what you're thinking from your vantage point. How is the world looking and how is it changing? So please come forward, tell us your stories, tell us the things you're excited about, tell us the things you feel challenged about so we can actually co-create and uh, participate in this new economy as it's happening and not just be a spectator. Thanks again, Sada, and I look forward to meeting in person. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to connect with Supply Show meeting you again.